All right, tonight's episode of Chemistry is brought to you by color. But before we can talk about color, we've got to talk about waves first, because really that's what color comes down to. All right, so let's label a couple pieces on this wave. So the high points, or the highest points on the wave, are called the crest, and the lowest points are called the trough. So there's another crest, there's another trough, another trough. And the distance between two successive peaks or two successive crests is called the wavelength. And so there would be your definition of a wavelength. It's the distance between two successive crests. And the symbol for wavelength is that guy right there, the gamma. It looks like a sad upside-down Y. And the units of wavelength are uh, nanometers, which are the small ones, or meters. And I'll show you how to transfer between those two later, later on. All right, so if you take a string and you wheel it up and down, you're going to produce a wave that looks a lot like this. And what it's going to appear like is that the waves, so each of these crests, are going to be moving in a particular direction. So if we're wiggling the string from over on this side, we're going to see those waves move through that direction. Now, if we were to mark a spot up there and then count the number of times that a crest moves through that spot every second, that would be referred to as the frequency of the wave. So I ran out of room there, but the definition for frequency is the number of times a crest moves through a point every second. So it would be the number of times if we were to count, time it for one second, and then count how many times those crests move through that point right there. That would be the frequency. And the units of frequency is hertz, which is what you would dial your radio to. You know, 750 would be 750 megahertz. And the symbol for that is H. Z, so capital H, lowercase z. So the significance of waves, or, or uh, light waves in particular, is it's what gives us different colors. So when we see things that are different colors, it's, it's because a different wavelength is being produced, or a different frequency is being produced. When you look at a white light, and so like the sun is fairly white, or a bulb that's fairly white, really it's not a white color. It's composed of all of the colors of the rainbow. Some of you guys might remember that from some of the other science classes. And if we shine a white light through a prism, so think of like a water drop or any little uh, piece of glass that's angled like that, what it'll do is it'll break it apart into all the different colors of the rainbow. This is literally what a rainbow is doing. Rainbow is uh, the sun shining through water, and then the water breaks apart those wavelengths of the sunlight into the different colors, and we can see them individually. But our brain can't process individual colors, so instead it just kind of melds them all together, and we see it as a white light. Now when you see something that's purple, it's because really there's blue and there's reds uh, shining through, but our brain can't process two different colors at once, and so it just molds them together, and we visualize that as purple. So what we can see from this chart is a couple different things. First off, uh, the different colors are all associated with different wavelength ranges, and we see it's called like reds, and it's called reds because there's not one color red. There's different shades of red. You can have a little bit reddish orange, you can have a darker red, lighter red, and they would all fall within that range right there, so that range of wavelengths. Uh, here's all the different wavelengths for all the different colors. You'll also notice that each one has a different amount of energy. Something significant is the energy increases as you go down here, but the wavelength decreases. So as energy increases, wavelength decreases, so those two are opposites. The uh, color with the highest wavelength would be red, and red also has the lowest energy. Violet has the highest energy, but the lowest or the shortest wavelength. And then something else that's really significant is the speed. So notice how the speed that all of these travel through a vacuum is identical. They all travel 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that's a constant, that's a very important number. Another way we can use prisms, then, is to identify different elements. So hydrogen, if we put it in a gas discharge tube, which is this guy right here, uh, think of that like a neon light. Okay, a neon light, you hook it up to electricity, it glows a really bright, different color. Now, that color that we see when we look at it is not necessarily a single wavelength. Okay, we see color because our brain just meshes a bunch of wavelengths together. If we run the color that we see through a prism, it will break it apart just like it does the white light. However, since it is not white light, and hydrogen gas is actually kind of a, a pinkish color when it's uh, hooked up to electricity, what we are seeing is four different wavelengths being melded together. 
It doesn't have all of the colors like white light does, just certain ranges. So what you're seeing right here, this is called the spectral lines of hydrogen. And what it is showing us is the four different wavelengths of light that are produced by a sample of hydrogen when it's given energy. So when we take it, give it energy, shine it through a prism, we're going to produce these four spectral lines always. Our now this is significant. In fact, it's really important because hydrogen only produces those four spectral lines. It's unique to hydrogen. It's the only element that's going to make those four particular guys. It's the fingerprint of hydrogen. It's how we can identify it. So, I mean, if we have a sample of hydrogen here in America, or one over in Europe somewhere, they're going to produce the exact same spectral lines. So we can use this then to identify elements. Down here we see boron, and boron has completely different spectral lines than hydrogen. And once again, this is something unique to boron. We can identify a sample of boron based upon these spectral lines. So, I mean, this is a picture right here. If we were to look at a sample of boron, we would see all of these lines produced in the exact same place with the same wavelengths. This doesn't change from place to place or atom to atom or even uh, state of matter to state of matter. Solid, liquid, gas, if you give it the energy, they're always going to produce their unique spectral lines. Hydrogen is always going to look like that. Boron's always going to look like that. You can type this into Google and look at the spectral lines for every single element known to mankind. So why is that? Why do the different elements make the different spectral lines? Where do those spectral lines come from in the first place? Well, they come from the electrons, which is actually what most of this unit's going to be about. This picture's a little bit rough to see. It's blown up bigger than what it should be, but it's just the Bohr model of an atom. So here in the center, we have a nucleus. That's where the protons and neutrons are. Definitely not drawn to scale. Remember, that's going to be a fraction or a tiny, tiny piece of the atom. And then surrounding the atom, we have n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And what those represent are the different energy levels where the electrons are found. Now let's say, for example, that this is hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron, and that one electron is going to be found here in the first energy level. So th this is actually kind of important. Electrons, they're lazy. They want to have the lowest amount of energy as possible, which means you're never going to find hydrogen's one valence electron, you know, out here somewhere, or right there even, because they're going to naturally want to go as close to the nucleus as they can get. Now, I'm not saying they don't ever go up. They, they do. We'll talk about that. But naturally, on their own, they're always found the closest place possible. And what we call this is the ground state. And the ground state means that all the electrons are in the lowest available energy level. So there's still room in that first energy level, so that's where the electron's going to go. If we were to add a second electron and make it helium, it would also go in the first energy level. And if we add the third electron, make it lithium, it's, there's no longer room in n equals 1, so it's going to have to go up to n equals 2. And then we keep going on and on and on like that. And as long as they're all in the lowest energy level possible, it is called the ground state. Okay, so let's consider hydrogen again. Hydrogen has its one valence electron in the lowest energy level. Now, if we pump this with some energy, let's say we hook it up to some electricity source like we did with the gas discharge tube, what that means is, is we are giving that atom energy. And think of this electron like you would a ball. Now, if you take a ball and give it energy by pushing it upwards, what's it going to do? It's going to go up. And so this electron then, depending on how much energy you give it, is going to move up to a different energy level. And so it's going to go up there, and it's going to move from the ground state up to the top, and we now call this the excited state. So when you give a particular atom energy, and this can be done in a variety of ways, hooking it up to an electrical power source, uh, lighting it on fire, or just shining a light on it, what you're doing is you're giving that electron energy so that it can jump from the ground state up to the excited state. So it's moving up to a different energy level. Depending upon the amount of energy and the electron, it might move to different ones. And so with hydrogen, it could move up to this third, it could move up to the fourth like we saw here, or the fifth, or even the sixth or seventh. Depends on the amount of energy and how it hits that particular atom. Just like when you throw a ball up in the air, what's going to happen? It just stays up there, right? And then you got to climb some stairs to get your ball back. No, it falls back down, right? Gravity pulls it back down. The charge from the nucleus is going to pull that electron back down. It's not going to stay up here in the excited state. It will fall back down to ground level. When it does that, 
depending upon the amount of energy that went in, that same amount of energy comes back out. So let me say that again. The electron is bumped up to the excited state with a certain amount of energy. So that energy comes in, hits that electron, bumps it up, and then it falls back down and releases the same amount of energy. And energy is equated to wavelength. So depending upon that fall, different amount of energy, different wavelength, different wavelength, different color. So let's say that that particular fall produces a blue wavelength. We would then see that with our eyes, and we would perceive it as blue color. And that electron can make all kinds of jumps. It can go from the fourth back down to the third. It can go from the fifth to the second. In each one of those transitions, from excited state back down to ground state, produce different colors. And that's what we see then when we look at them through a prism and see those different spectral lines. We're seeing different falls of electrons. So if we come back here and look at our spectral lines for hydrogen, each one of these, one, two, three, four different wavelengths that are produced are caused by different transitions of electrons. So in all four of these cases, you have the electron going from the excited state, falling back down to the ground state, releasing these particular wavelengths of energy that we then perceive as four different colors. Whoa, mind's blown. All right, let's talk about how we can equate this with some math. So first off, a couple constants. So make sure you have these written in your notebook and, and then highlight them or circle them somewhere where you can find them because you're going to need to look these up or know these several times throughout this unit. So the first one is just the speed of light that we looked back at in the first slide. And that's 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that, that you guys, is that's really quick. That's more than just a normal sprint. If we were to put this out completely, it would be three with uh, eight zeros behind it. So that means 300 million meters every second. So let's count a second together. And one. So in that time right there, a single wave of light will travel 300 million meters. And that's really quick. That's why when you flip on a light, it doesn't take a little bit for the light to reach your eyes. It's there instantly. And sorry, I should have said this earlier. The symbol for the speed of light is the letter C. It's a lowercase c. So when you see it in equations, that's how it's written. And the next one is what's called Planck's constant, which is symbolized with a lowercase h. So when you see it in equations, it looks like an h. And the value of Planck's constant is kind of a funny one. It's 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. So that's joules times seconds. And joules is a measurement of energy. Seconds is obviously a measurement of time. So this would be a value that we'd use then to find the energy of a particular wavelength. And don't trouble yourselves too much with what this number means. Just remember this number. It's a constant. It's always the same. So when you see it in an equation, you just plug that number in and solve. All right, now we need some equations to solve for things. So the first one is just what's called the wave equation, and that says that C, the speed of light, is equal to the wavelength, which we symbolize with the delta, times the frequency, and frequency, that's a new one, symbolized with kind of an italic V. Now, C is always a constant, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th, so that'll never be a concern of yours. You just plug that number in, and all you really have to solve for is either wavelength or frequency. And so wavelength, units do matter on all of these. Wavelength has to be in meters. And the reason it has to be in meters is because speed is in meters per second. It's something really important you're going to run into a lot here in chemistry is units have to match up. That way they cancel each other out. So speed is in meters per second. Wavelength has to be in meters. If you go back a couple slides and look at the measurements of wavelength, typically they're in nanometers, which means you're going to have to make a conversion. And I'll show you how to do that. And then frequency, of course, is in hertz. Then the second equation deals with energy. And so this one says the energy of a particular photon, or wavelength of light, is equal to Planck's constant times that wave's frequency. So there's frequency again, same guy, frequency in uh, hertz. So the units of energy, which is symbolized with a capital E, are joules. Joules is a measurement of energy. And Planck's constant, we already know, is joules seconds. So once again, there's that matching of units. 
and then frequency is still in hertz. So there you go, those are the only two equations that you're really going to need to know. With those two, you can solve almost anything in this unit. First, I need to show you how to convert between nanometers and meters. So a, a nanometer is extremely tiny because wavelengths are extremely tiny uh, when we deal with light. And so that's why most of the time when you look at wavelengths, they're going to be given to you in nanometers. But because of the speed of light in meters per second, we're going to have to always convert those into meters. So to make that conversion, you take whatever particular nanometers you are given, so blank nanometers, and you multiply it by 10 to the negative ninth, and that will give you your new number in meters. So let's say, for example, we have a wave that is 480 nanometers in wavelength, and we want to convert that over. Well, we just multiply it by 10 to the negative ninth, and then that would come out to be 480 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Or, or if you put this into your calculator, it's going to tell you that it's 4.80 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. So this, this is a really small number. In the case of this guy right here, it's just 480 with six zeros in front. So very, very tiny. Sometimes you might have to convert back from meters to nanometers, in which case it's just the opposite process. So you have blank meters, you're going to multiply that by 10 to the positive ninth, and that will give you your answer in meters, nanometers, sorry. So for example, if we have something that is 3.90 times 10 to the negative seventh uh, meters, we would multiply that by 10 to the ninth, and that would then tell us that it is 390 nanometers. So let's practice this real quick, and we'll practice it with hydrogen. So here is the spectral lines from the previous slide, and then here's an actual picture of a hydrogen spectrum. And so right here, the 656, that would be our red guy right there, and the 410, that would be our light purple, blue, and light blue are all represented here. So let's start with that light blue line, the 486 nanometer line. So first off, what's the frequency of that wave? We've got the wavelength, and we know that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So we know what the speed of light is, it's always the same. So we can rearrange this equation then and solve for frequency instead. So we would divide both sides by wavelength, and that would cancel out wavelength. So that means that frequency is going to be equal to the speed of light divided by wavelength. And so we can just plug our numbers in. We've got to make sure that we convert 486 nanometers into meters by multiplying by 10 to the negative ninth. And that number is going to go up into our equation as 486 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. So even though you're following along at home, go ahead and type this into your calculator just to make sure that you get the same answer as I do. And then, you know, type it in a couple times just to make sure that it matches up. What you should get, and if we write this out, it's kind of sloppy, but it's 6.17 times 10 to the 14. And so that's written in scientific notation, so that's 617 with 12 zeros behind it. So it's a very, very large number. And then what are the units on this? Well, since it's frequency, that means the units are going to be hertz. And so it's important that we always put units on our numbers. No naked numbers. They make me blush. So there's our final answer. That would be the frequency, then, of this particular spectrum line right there. It's 486 nanometers wavelength. 6.17 times 10 to, the or 10 to the 14th hertz. All right, now let's take that same line and let's figure out how much energy is there is in that particular wave. So we know that as the wavelength changes, so does the amount of energy, and those two are inverse, so as the wavelength goes up, energy goes down. And the different amount of energy, different wavelength, then translates to different colors. So for this particular wave, uh, well, first of all, we'd want to look at that equation. So energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. So make note that this deals with frequency, not with wavelength. So we can't just plug in the 486 there and call it good. We need to take that number from the last problem. So always make sure that you use frequency on this question, not the wavelength. Sometimes you might need to convert wavelength to frequency like we just did. 
And Planck's constant, it's a constant, which means it's always the same. It's 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. And so we can plug that number right in. So let's solve for energy, and it's equal to Planck's constant. And we're going to multiply that by the frequency. We found the frequency in the previous slide, and it's 6.17 times 10 to the 14th. So plug that into your calculator. Let's, let's everyone practice this. Good calculator skills are going to be important for this unit. And when you do, you should get the number 4.09 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And what that tells us then is the energy of a single photon of that particular wavelength. So if we had just a single beam, if you will, of that color light, it's going to have this amount of energy, which is a very small number because it's a very, very small wavelength, a very, very small piece. Hey, so that's all the new stuff for this. If you're feeling comfortable with it, go ahead and stop the video. Do the practice problems that I've put for, on the website for you guys. If you're still a little bit rusty, we'll go ahead and do one more practice problem together, and we'll do the red light. And we're going to find for that red light the same thing. We're going to find the frequency and then the energy. So what I want you guys to do then is go ahead, pause the video, give it a shot, see if you can do it on your own. If you run into some trouble or just want to check the answer, resume the video and see what's up. Alright, so here we go. First, to find the frequency, we're going to use this equation. So C equals lambda times the frequency. Um, we're going to solve for the frequency part. So just rearrange the equation. Uh, speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters. So that means constant speed of light, 656 times, times 10 to the negative ninth. That would be the particular wavelength right there, converted from nanometers into meters. We can now plug this into our calculators and solve to get our frequency. And that comes out to be 4.57 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So that's a very, very fast frequency. That means every second, a crest of that wave would pass through a particular point. 4.57 times 10 to the 14th or 457 with 12 zeros behind at times. And here we go to solve for energy. We take that Planck's constant, which is always the same number, multiply it by the frequency for this particular wave, which we just calculated on the previous slide. When we do that, we will get the energy in joules, and it comes out to be 3.03 .03 times 10 to the negative 19th joules.